Good to see you, Azanka. How are you doing today? Hi, hi. I'm doing good. How are you? I'm better than I deserve, for sure. So let's try to share your screen, just to make sure everything is yes. working correctly, and then I'll yep. get out of your way. In the meantime, I'm going to be quickly introducing you. So Azanga is the Keith Technology Evangelist at VueSO2. You know, it's the company making a lot of tooling for microservices and stuff. In particular, the their API gateway is probably one of the most uh, known open source product they have. And so the topic is going to be talking about today is um, a decentralized reference architecture for clothing native applications. So I can see that the slides are on. So take it away. I'm leaving the stage. Yep. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, introduction. So hi, everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. I know now the events are global and you might be uh, joining from various parts of the world. Uh, so yes, I'm Asanka Basinger and the Chief uh, Technology Evangelist at WSO2. So WSO2 is a, a technology company that we provide uh, uh, products on integration, API and uh, identity uh, management. Uh, but today I'm not planning to talk much about WSO2. Um, uh, it's about uh, this new concept that uh, we introduce and I'm going in detail about that. So before jumping into that, I'll give a quick introduction about myself. Uh, so I born in Sri Lanka. If you are not aware about Sri Lanka, it's a nice island in the Indian Ocean. And I studied in Ireland. And now I live in San Francisco Bay Area. So I love basketball and these are my heroes. And um, uh, I live next to the uh, Levi Stadium uh, that is home of 49ers. So I'm following um, American football as well. And whatever happened with LinkedIn Park, still more than 80% of uh, my iTunes store is packed with the LinkedIn Park uh, uh, audios. And um, this is my family. And this is the new addition to our family. That is my personal profile. I'll quick uh, uh, give a quick introduction about my professional profile as well. I started my career as a COBOL uh, programmer in late 90s and went through um, various stages, even uh, start, uh, started a company uh, sometime back in 2005. And now um, uh, acting as the chief technology evangelist. And the latest achievement I achieved is getting uh, into the Forbes Technology Council and I'm an active member there as well. So uh, during this 25 minutes, this is what I'm trying to cover, uh, give an introduction to this new pattern and then uh, talk a little bit about how we created uh, this pattern and then uh, go in detail about what it is and how you can uh, use this in your day-to-day -day, um, architecture or application development work. So uh, after we introduced this uh, uh, concept in 2018 summer, uh, myself and our CTO, Paul Fremantle, uh, we got invited to uh, uh, speak about this concept in many architecture conferences, including O'Reilly, um, API World, and um, QCon, uh, those kind of conferences. And whenever I entered uh, to that room, I saw something like that. Uh, that people who was in the uh, session, they gave a look like this by uh, looking at me and then checking whether is this guy smoking because uh, people uh, thinking these days cloud native architecture and microservices architecture addressing most of the issues that we have in the market. So the question is why we need another uh, architecture pattern or a reference architecture. Actually, we were not smoking. Uh, we had some legit uh, reasons to come up with this architecture pattern. The first um, the motivation factor was based on our experience in the industry as well as what we heard from our customers and users, existing architecture patterns are not addressing uh, the uh, teething problems these architects are having as well as that helps to um, implement application uh, development. So that was the key uh, motivation that we had, um, this mismatch and identify uh, those uh, reasons for the mismatch and uh, fill that gap. So I'll, I'll go in detail about that. The first motivation factor was uh, the current architecture styles are centralized and layered. Uh, so, um, uh, the, if you look at it, uh, most of the architectures used uh, in enterprises are layered. And what happens with layers, 
layers creating gates in between um, uh, the uh, message flows as well as uh, as a uh, organization different teams own different layers so it is not an efficient flow like uh, to get something done you have to go through different layers so that slow down the productivity or the agility of the team so that is the uh, main um, issue that we identify with most of the existing architecture patterns then if you look at the architecture diagrams most of the architects are drawing those are very clean um, uh, very uh, aligned uh, and looks really nice but if you go and look at what's the reality and what's really happening in the enterprises it looks like this because we purchase many systems during last two decades and we purchase many um, data management systems and code systems as well as we developed um, in-house applications so uh, we have all these uh, different kind of uh, data systems that we can't throw overnight and build a uh, greenfield application so the reality is you have legacy and monolith uh, related applications as well as you need to build microservices and new age applications as well and in a large enterprise actually the legacy and monolith part is more than uh, what you get in microservices and um, the new age uh, technologies so uh, and another thing that we identify most of the existing patterns addressing one uh, part of the story either it's a legacy architecture or it is 100 percent microservices architecture but the reality you need something uh, you can address both so we thought of define something that you can apply for legacy as well as microservices um, both parts then most of the existing architecture patterns that if you google and find those are not really reference architectures those are reference implementation why i say that most of these patterns are uh, addressing a specific technology or uh, a specific um, uh, vendor technology and those are vendor, not vendor neutral and not technology neutral but we thought if it is an architecture pattern or a reference architecture it has to be completely vendor neutral as well as technology neutral so uh, that is one design objective that we had uh, the architecture that we are defining has to be uh, has to be technology and vendor neutral and uh, people should be able to pick the uh, technology based on their desire then the next issue we saw in the enterprise that under utilization of technology as an example when i walk to some of the um, organizations they say okay we have a kafka broker running but we can't connect and use it because our architecture doesn't support it. And sometimes they say, okay, we have a NoSQL uh, databases running, but um, we can't use it because our architecture not uh, supporting that. So we thought of uh, to fix that issue as well. And then how you can optimally utilize the, uh, the current technology as well as any new technology coming into the market can be utilized and add to the existing architecture then uh, the next uh, thing that we identified there's a massive gap in between the architecture development and deployment that architect develop architect design something a developer develops something slightly different and then the devops engineer will go and deploy something completely uh, different from what the architect did so we wanted to bridge that gap as well then the dependency management came into the picture with the uh, rise of microservices if you look at the this popular diagram from uber when you have many moving parts it get really complicated while having this decentralization and flexibility you need to have some dependency management and governance incorporated as well so before jump into the architecture pattern the new architecture pattern let's look at what really happened so these um, uh, the monolithical architecture started in 1970s and then it went to two-tier architecture then the three-tier or the most uh, interesting era came around 90s and the 3 tier architecture got improved with uh, model view controller then the service oriented architecture came with sub patterns like event driven architecture web oriented architecture and around 2012 the microservices architecture came into the picture so what i want to highlight here it moved from a layered architecture into a more segmented approach um, with the time uh, 
And this is the architecture diagram that I defined sometime back in early uh, 2011, 2010 timeframe. Uh, it's a little different from the typical layered architecture that this is a two dimensional um, view and still a lot of people using this and it was a very successful um, pattern at that time. Uh, but we use this pattern and implement a system uh, and uh, what we identified in one project that we did in Seattle area, uh, Washington state, uh, that uh, a team built a platform using 100 API, 60 message flows um, with uh, n number of databases, but the system went into production after three years. And after the system went into production uh, in three years, the system was not um, uh, usable at all because the uh, business was looking uh, for something completely different. They were following agility and we were wondering even if they follow agility, why the project failed. The main reason that we identified the architecture was not agile enough and uh, it, has, it has not supported the agile teams to perform well. So it was kind of waterfall agile in this uh, particular scenario. So this was eye opener for us and we started looking at uh, what we can do. And the microservices came into the picture and uh, the technology giants like Netflix, Uber, eBay, they started working on the microservices. But one common thing we identify, even these organizations were using microservices, they started putting a layer on top of this. As example, Netflix, Netflix call it as APIs, Uber call it as edge gateways. So what happened with the, uh, the, that time, uh, again, it became another layered architecture that microservices resides inside a layer and other components were supporting for that. Uh, so then we identified some of the people using some infrastructure level advantages and try to segment this thing and try to create some isolated areas. They use multi-tenancy as well as this uh, method called platform of platforms used heavily as well. But all these uh, two patterns were uh, again layered. So we thought uh, this is not going to work. We have to come up from this uh, particular layered uh, architecture and uh, define something new. So we thought of we should start from scratch. So I'll talk a little bit about how we uh, made this decision and what are the, uh, the, the, uh, the background story or behind the scene, uh, what really happened while defining this. So what we did, we did um, a lot of research, read the, the research papers published by many universities. We read different type of books. And uh, most importantly, we talked to uh, WSO2 users as well as WSO2 customers and asked what are the architecture challenges that they are facing. And we narrowed down our research into uh, four areas, uh, quantum computing and uh, the really good uh, concepts brought by Kubernetes about distributed architectures. And interestingly, uh, biology and system biology, because we identified there's a link between biology uh, to what we are trying to achieve here. And at the same time, we uh, took a look at what is the business and technical uh, requirement of services because everything uh, is about services and microservices. And if you look at uh, a technical definition of a service, it's about how you can provide some kind of capabilities um, available as a network accessible code and define a clear definition. If you look at the diagram, there's a, a way that you send the messages and there's a binding listening port and a code. And if you look at the code, it's a simple uh, set of code annotated and make it a uh, network accessible endpoint. So that is a service. But the, the business definition of the service is a little different. What a business is looking at provide a solution for a business problem. But to provide a solution to a business problem, you have to connect number of services and uh, uh, provide a composite services, uh, composite, composite service or a uh, user gateway and then achieve that particular requirement. So that is what business was looking at. So that's why we used ESBs, gateways, uh, composite services and try to achieve this um, requirement. If you look at microservices, again, no difference. It's a, again, set of code that you annotate and then make it uh, available as a network endpoint. Uh, the, the concept of micro comes in the scope uh, rather than size. A lot of people think it's about the size. Uh, it's not the size, basically. It's about the scope, how you can scope it properly and divide 
the, a service into multiple services. Uh, and if you look at the business definition of the microservices, it doesn't vary. It's about uh, providing a business capability to a set of problems that you have. To do that, again, you have to connect microservices and uh, provide it as a uh, meaningful endpoint for the consumers to consume. So uh, to do that, you need to group these microservices and that grouping, we call it as a cell. So that is the uh, definition of the cell and how the cell came into the picture. Uh, so in, in, uh, in um, the real world that the cell is a, a basic structure and everything uh, built on cells. So that is the uh, key motivation why we refer biology as well as use the name cell uh, to define this architecture pattern. So let's get in detail about the architecture pattern. So in this pattern, the atomic unit, we call it as a component. Uh, a component can be any, can be any runtime that you run. It can be a service, microservice, a gateway, a database, a message broker, any runtime that you run in your uh, enterprise can treat it as a component. So the cell is a, a collection of components and there are basic um, uh, features that a cell uh, contains that it, each and every cell contain uh, a cell gateway and in number of components and if you look at the ratio it can be uh, one to many in most cases but there can be situation it can be one to one as well and cells need to be connected and to connect cells we are using this management plane data plane and control plane concept and i believe most of you are aware of these concepts but if you look at it as a uh, analogy of uh, trains and uh, railways uh, you can treat the railway as the control plane and the uh, the train as the data plane which carries the actual messages and then the uh, control center as the management plane and in this concept you have uh, intercell communication and intracell communication as well so there's a control plane and a data plane a local control plane and a data plane as well as there's a global control plane and a data plane as well so we call it as a local mesh and global mesh as well and if you are aware with service mesh concepts i would say this is service mesh plus plus and uh, there are many uh, uh, communication requirements that you have basically you need to do ingress calls all the ingress calls should go through uh, a cell gateway but if you are doing egress calls you can uh, use sidecar adapter and ambassador patterns and go outside from uh, a cell but the beauty of this architecture pattern the outgoing call should hit another cell gateway and this is the api first architecture intercell communication and intracell communication will happen using an api but it is not only restful http grpc type of uh, apis it can be anything it can be events it can be streams so and so forth so uh, you can use any protocol and binding and define this APIs. So the gateway pattern provides a lot of advantages here. You can enforce policies as well as you can enable observability in this uh, uh, pattern. And the security of the cells, uh, there are two ways that you can do. Uh, it can be a self-contained uh, uh, security that uh, internal or local STS will handle it that's running in the local control plane, or you can get help from uh, external IDP as well. So there can be many use cases that uh, a person might build a brand new cell or they can convert existing cells into um, uh, this uh, existing components into a cell as cell. We support both in this pattern. And if you look at the developer flow, the developer will not do any changes. They will uh, write the code, build it, commit, test, push, and it will go into CICD and uh, infrastructure as a code or any other uh, deployment codes that you have written can be utilized to deploy these cells into uh, your uh, deployment. And life cycle of a cell, each cell contains a version and each uh, component contains a version. So that will allow you to do blue green, uh, canary or uh, rainbow type of deployments as well. And this uh, creates something called a structured agility that you will have agility at the uh, component level you will have agility at the cell level and you will have agility at the uh, enterprise level. So uh, three layers of agility will provide more flexibility for you.
So the uh, if you look at it as an enterprise architecture, you will see something like this, uh, cells everywhere inside your enterprise. And we can categorize these cells into logic, integration, legacy, external data, identity, and channel. These are the type of cells that I identified for now, but we can introduce in the future. But I believe uh, more than 80% of the current uh, requirements in the enterprise can address by using these uh, cell types. And if you look at the reference implementation, I took the example that uh, you can define your cells uh, using uh, your requirements. Uh, Domain-driven design is one way that you can uh, define the cell boundaries and then define this uh, shared context uh, and uh, use that uh, as a, a concept to define the cell boundaries. And if you look at uh, this diagram, the same reference implementation using different technologies. Uh, as I said, it's completely technology neutral that you can use any technology and build uh, this architecture. Then it's a very human centric architecture that uh, you can use the cell com concept to uh, allow a team to build a cell or multiple cells. Rule of thumb here, one, a uh, team can own multiple cells, but a cell cannot be shared among other teams. If you want to share the functionality, you have to use APIs and do that. So I wrote an article in Forbes uh, about cellular enterprise. If you are interested about this, um, uh, how it connects with humans, you can uh, read that as well. And recently, there's a uh, author called uh, uh, Christopher wrote an article about the cell-based uh, architecture concept. A uh, person I don't know, but it's a very nice architecture uh, paper that you can go and check that too. And uh, so how you measure the success? Because now you are adopting to a, a new architecture pattern. You need to show some results to the business. So there are a bunch of ways that you can do that. The first uh, matrix I would suggest is flow efficiency, uh, like how you can show your wait time is minimal, uh, but your productivity time is high. And then you can use uh, MTTR, mean time to repair, MTTD, mean time to detect kind of uh, metrics and show how you have been productive by using this particular method. So in summary, cell is a self-contained uh, unit. You can deploy it as a unit as well as it's independently scalable and it contains a local uh, data and control plane. And as an architecture, it's decentralized, microservices compliant, cloud native uh, and technology neutral, human centric as well as you can build APIs as a product using this architecture pattern. So the contribution to this, what we have done, basically uh, you can refer this architecture paper in GitHub. It's released under Creative Common Commons. So uh, feel free to send a PR as well as uh, if you uh, see, uh, if you like the architecture paper, give us a Git uh, a star. And I wrote another paper related to this a reference methodology paper in this particular URL uh, to have a way to implement the architecture. And uh, there are supportive products or the supportive projects that we have done. A ballerina is a, um, a language that we have introduced that you can build components. And uh, we have a bunch of micro runtimes that you can use at components as well. And we did a pet project called Celery. Uh, that is a reference implementation that you can refer it and get an idea how uh, this can make it more practical as well. Um, so that's all I have. And these are my contact details. If you are interested about this pattern or get some consultancy, you can uh, contact me uh, from this. You can add me on Twitter and LinkedIn, and um, I'm happy to help with that. Um, so let me stop sharing. Yeah, thank you very much, Zanka. Uh, I've been checking the uh, chat for the whole time. I don't see any question yeah. for you right now, but make sure to check the stage. You know, somebody may pop up later. Yeah. Uh, we're super in time. So again, it's going to be virtual applause, but I guess everybody is kind of clapping for you. Again, thank you. 